Good morning. Welcome to Park Road Baptist Church on a cold winter Sunday. It's kind of fun to come to church in the snow, isn't it? I love that look. I'm glad to be here and the warm in the room. Uh, one of my favorite things that's happened uh, to us during the during pandemic is our pre-service music. I appreciate so much Matthew's music. Chris White played for us uh, a couple weeks ago. We're looking forward to continuing that, and I appreciate that time to get settled in and sit down and meditate a little bit as we prepare to worship. We're glad to have you here. We have folks joining us online, so thank you for being here. I'm a little under the weather. Some of you have uh, <clears throat> been where I am this past week. Um, I struggled a little bit. You could hear it in my throat. I, I've had three negative tests this week. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I feel that, but I, um, I, I will keep my distance today. I've spread out the chairs for our interview a little bit more, um, but glad to be here this morning and glad so many of you have made it to join us. Uh, a quick announcement from Joey and Liza. Young people, uh, you're invited to join Joey and Liza for lunch at Viva Chicken this afternoon right down on Park Road just after worship. Please join them. And also, we're recruiting children's Sunday school volunteers. This will begin in February. Um, maybe this season of calling and of getting you to think about your calling and where you can use your gifts will give you an opportunity to say, hey, maybe I can do that. If you'd be interested, uh, Joey and Liza would love to talk with you. Our children would be glad to hear from you. Thank you for being here this day. As Matthew continues and plays again for us, let us prepare our hearts and minds that we can worship God together.
Will you join with me as we read responsibly our litany of worship? Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. What can I do? There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. How can I serve? To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Wisdom, knowledge, healing, miracles, prophecies, tongues, interpretation. No, what can I do? To one is given faith by the same spirit, and faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So let me show you my faith by my works. Yes, I can do that. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, let us be open to listen for our gifts this morning and every morning. Let us listen for all the ways that we can take those gifts and callings into the world, into action. We are grateful for a spirit that gives us the faith to do the work in the world. With Jesus as our example, let us pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. How have you used you? What's the best stuff in you? What are your gifts? What are your talents? What are your passions? How have you used those? Or have you squandered them? Or have you pushed them down? Or have you simply been too tired to use you. Let us keep silence together. Join me, as to, join me as we pray together our prayer of confession. Too often, O oh God, we shy away from our own gifts. We say, who am I? What can I do? On the other hand, when we claim those gifts, sometimes we insist on using them alone. I can do it myself. Remind us that each of us has a gift and that our gift is part of a body of gifts, the body of Christ. Make us part of that body today. Amen. You can know this to be true. God says you are loved. You are forgiven. So be at peace.
course, we missed being together last week, but we read from 1 Corinthians 12 last week. And as I have read this whole chapter for the last two weeks, thought about Paul's words, I've had a little bit of confusion, maybe not altogether uncommon when reading Paul's words. But what is Paul saying? What is Paul's emphasis? Is the emphasis on the spiritual gifts, on the religious callings, teaching and preaching and prophesying and speaking in tongues and all that? Or is it something else? What are the greater gifts? And Paul seems to indicate that there are some other gifts. And in another listing in Romans 12, he lists much more common gifts, administering and teaching and ministry, which everyone can do, and charity. You know, all those as spiritual gifts. What are the spiritual gifts? We continue this morning with a little bit of that tension, and we'll hear that in Paul's words as we continue reading the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. Paul was amazingly egalitarian in his view. In another place he mentions male and female. No male and female. No Jews or Greeks, no slaves or free. All are one in Christ. And, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now here's where the confusion comes in a little bit, okay? The members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. There's a different kind of valuation in the body of Christ than in our society. Those that society deems weaker, we honor more. We clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. They get their kudos out there, right? We offer the, their honor here. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior members, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. We are in this together. If one member is honored, we rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles. Now here we go, back to Paul's reverence or uh, um, affirmation of the spiritual sounding gifts. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No. The answer is no. But Paul continues, but strive for the greater gifts. Now, I didn't study this this week, but I don't know whether Paul is referring to these gifts that he just mentioned. But strive for these gifts which are greater. Or is he referring to those gifts and saying, since not everyone is a teacher, an apostle, a preacher, a prophet, we all ought to strive for the greater gifts not those gifts that I've mentioned. I'm not sure which Paul is saying there. I will show you a still more excellent way. 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, says the greater way is the way of love. It makes me think the greater gifts are not the gifts specific to ministry in a career sense, in a professional sense, but the gifts and the callings of love which you can know in your work, in your life, in your everyday workaday world. I will show you a still more excellent way. Strive for the greater gifts. You've heard the ancient story. I'm going to call Darren to come and get ready for the interview over here. And while he's coming up, I'm going to ask him to, to give us a, a, his background and introduce himself. But let me introduce Darren Gant in this way. About 30 years ago, when I was the youth minister at First Baptist Church in Clemson, South Carolina, I took a group to Atlanta for a summer mission project. A Baptist church was being formed in Atlanta, and the pastor needed some help canvassing neighborhoods, meeting the neighbors so he could build a church. So I took my uh, youth group and we canvassed those neighborhoods for Reverend Tom Cantwell, who was the pastor of that new church. Peggy McIntyre was on that trip. Where's Peggy? She was on that trip walking around those neighborhoods. That's right, Peggy. Um, we were working for Tom Cantwell. I, I have maybe uh, had some incidental contact with Tom over the years through Facebook, but I hadn't seen Tom Cantwell in over 30 years. And about a decade ago, um, Tom's son was recruited as a quarterback for the Carolina Panthers. The quarterback and his father had gotten to know a persistent and inquiring reporter named Darren Gant. And church came up somehow in the, one of those conversations about professional football, church came up and Darren asked Reverend Cantwell where he might recommend that he go to church. And Tom Cantwell recommended Park Road Baptist Church. Now it wasn't long after Darren started visiting Park Road Baptist that he moved from the back row over there to Room in the Inn and then to the men's shelter and then to Marie G. Davis School, and then into every other mission project that we had going. He's now our missions ministry area coordinator on the church council and virtually indispensable to our mission efforts. And he still covers Carolina Panthers football. Since they're still playing football this season, not Carolina, but since NFL's still playing, I wasn't sure if Darren would be available this morning, but like just about everything else, uh, when we asked Darren, he said yes. And that was on top of spending the night last night at Room in the Inn. So I'm glad to have Darren here this morning to talk with us, um, not about Carolina Panthers football, but about maybe the greater gifts. So, Darren, there's a little bit of yeah. my introduction and, and how I got to know you. you. You make it sound like a lot better story than maybe it is. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm just a guy who writes deodorant commercials on TV. So. I'm glad somebody's been paying attention in church, right? Um, it is interesting how we connected. And talking about the body, the body of Christ and the larger Baptist body, that's how we got to know Darren through Tom Cantwell. Um, and, and this idea of body is so very important. So as we begin, I just thought I'd get Darren to yeah. give you the, the one-minute introduction of his life and the whirlwind, where you grew up and how you yeah. got to where you are. Grew up in uh, suburban Hickory, small town, uh, youngest of Sandra and Donald Gant's three boys, all Eagle Scouts. Um, Mom's very proud of that. And uh, moved off to the city to work for the newspaper like John Boyd Walton, left the family business. My family's in the nursery business back in Hickory and uh, done well in that over the years, but that was too much work. So I decided I'd go work for newspapers and do that kind of stuff. And uh, did that for a while, uh, had a couple kids, got divorced, came to Park Road, found these people, found a place to fit in. Uh, got married again this past summer, had a lovely uh, couple of pastors oversee that ceremony, which was nice, and uh, here we are. Wonderful. Tell us how much church was a part of your upbringing. Well, I mean, it, it was just context. It was, I, I was thinking the other week uh, when Reed Heaton gets up in this cold pool of water on Christmas Eve, I just thought, man, that was a deliberate and conscious step he took. In the church I grew up in, we baptized babies. You know, and we all wore the same baptismal gown, everybody in the same family. 
Yes, me and my daughter wore the same dress once upon a time, even though it was about 30 years apart. But uh, it, it, was, it was a more passive thing. It was just your context. It's where you grew up. You went to church on Sunday, youth group Sunday nights, you went to scouts on Tuesday, you know, and do all the things of the church. You know, first, Sunday in, or first Saturday in November, the church comes together, has a big pot pie supper where the whole church comes together, everybody does their individual thing, and we feed the community, and it's our big money raising thing. It was just part of the calendar. It was what you were used to every day. It's kind of interesting there and talks about church as sort of passive context. He's clearly moved from passive context to active seeking, I think. Um, we're going to get to that in just a minute, but tell us what drew you to professional sports, and is that a passion for you or just a job? It, it has been both over the years, to be perfectly honest with you. I had a story uh, when I was a young boy, went to a baseball game down in Atlanta, and, and to tell the clean version of the story, I asked a ball player a question that elicited a funny response that... You know, and, and I figured out I could go to ballparks and talk to ball players, and every now and then one of them will say a funny thing, and, and maybe I could do this more often. And I've been around, seen some interesting stuff, and, and it is, uh, it, it's been a blessing to be able to do a lot of that stuff. I mean, there are days, just like every other job, it's kind of a job, but, you know, there are worse things to do in exchange for money. I'd asked you this question once before, I think on a Wednesday night. I remember hearing you say the thing that drew you, uh, part of what drew you to it was the stories, right. not, not just the football, right. not just the achievement, not, but the individual stories, and that that really connects you to what you're doing. Yeah, here. absolutely. And the thing about ball teams are they're like church congregations. I mean, there's people from every corner of the globe, um, race, backgrounds, everything you'd want, and finding out it, about each of those guys and, and their own thing. We hear an awful lot about star quarterbacks and this, that, and the other, but, you know, every team's got guys, third stringers, et cetera, who's got their own background. There was a young guy who played for the Panthers this year named Sean Chandler who grew up poor in New Jersey in a homeless shelter, and I, I enjoyed talking to Sean about his journey and making it out of you know, his, his hometown in New Jersey, which is one of the poorest places in America, to be able to make it to the NFL and to be able to share that story is one thing I can do, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Darren, I, I tell you, like lots of folks, you had been somewhat out of church for yeah. some years um, when you ran into Tom Cantwell and mm -hmm. asked him for a recommendation. I, I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about that. What was it that drew you to ask about finding a church? Well, I think, and part of it was, um, without getting too deep into it, when you are divorced, there is an isolation, and you withdraw from the context you had at that point. And being without that kind of family context and being without the kind of avenue to serve that I was used to growing up uh, was tough, and, and it is something I wanted to get back to. I wanted my kids to be able to see it. I wanted them to be able to be a part of youth group and that kind of stuff that I had access to when I was a kid. So, yeah, I did seek it out, and, you know, it, it was an extremely accidental meeting that, that brought us here together, but uh, Tom Cantwell did a good thing getting me here. I like to think maybe it was a providential meeting, not an accidental one. So, um, uh, nobody's been more active in our missions program in recent years. I, I really appreciate this this idea of moving from passive context to active seeking. And, and you clearly have actively sought ways to be involved. And I wonder, what are the similarities and what are the differences in the way you find your passion here and in what you do in your career? Um, that's a tough one. And I started, you mentioned this the other day and I've sort of struggled with it. And I don't, I think back to one of the things I've always enjoyed, I like covering ball games and being part of newspapers, but I love being in newsrooms. And one of the neat things about my job now is I'm around a, a bigger group of young people, designers, photographers, videographers, that kind of thing. And it reminds me of the old great newsrooms I've been a part of where everybody does their own individual thing and does it in their own way and you come together and I get an energy from being around the people I work with um, you know and I couldn't they do things I can't do uh, and you hope that it becomes part of a greater good but I just I, I enjoy the idea of being around people 
for a common effort. For I, lack of I hear a lot there, Darren, about the person-to-person -person contact. Yeah. And, and rather than doing a job, is being involved in people's lives, hearing yeah. their stories, being a part of that. Yeah. Um, last week's interview that we didn't get to do was supposed to be about individual gifts. And today we were moving toward thinking about being part of a larger community and work within the body of Christ. So talk with us for just a moment about individual gifts versus work within the community. How are an individual and that person's participation within the larger community related? It's another tough one. You're good at this. You should have been a reporter or something. <laughs> if you, you know. it's, I, I, I think that everybody in this church has something to offer. I mean, and, and I remember one time on a Wednesday night when Amy was talking about one of her trips to Mexico. And we were cleaning up after the service, and I said, I can't fix immigration policy, but I can stack up the chairs afterward. And, and I think each one of us has something to offer. And it seems, you know, it might seem small. I mean, last night I slept on a couch in the youth building. Then not that big a deal. Got up, made a pot of coffee, just like I do every morning at the house. But I do think there's an opportunity for everybody to find a place. And that's one of the neat things about Park Road for me was finding a place where it was easy to fit in. There was so much going on here and so many opportunities that when I came here, met Russ and Amy, met Dan, you find out about all these different avenues and, and yeah, you can find a spot to fit in pretty easily here. Let me give you the last word to make a pitch to your fellow church members here. Uh, thinking about missions yeah. involvement at Park Road Baptist Church, where do we need help? Uh, all over the place. We did again room at the end last night we'll do it again later this month and twice more in february and march uh, we are going to need to pack more snack bags from Reggie davis in february uh, we've got all kind of opportunities dan's about to put an item in the newsletter that you can look out for uh, loaves and fishes is looking for drivers we've got opportunities all over town but it's not just that stuff i mean we've got groups the needlers who make all the dresses that we take to Cuba for the little girls and different sewn items over the years. So all kind of ways to plug in here. And if there's something you can do, I'm pretty sure we can find a way to steer it. I'm so grateful for Darren Gant, for his individual gifts and for the way he's plugged into this body. I love the story that we have together, the way we've come together through the larger Baptist body and for the work that he's done. And I hope he's inspired you this morning that maybe you're going to say yes to something new in the coming days. Darren, thank you. Yep. May it be so.
Well, that kind of summed it up, Allison. Last week, we looked at the verses leading up to the verses for today, as Russ just mentioned. I told you how I kept misreading the text. Paul wanted them not to be uninformed, but what I kept seeing as I was reading it was, do not be uniformed. And there's a really big difference in not being uninformed and not being uniformed. Just be completely you with all of your gifts, all of your talents, all of your passions. Here's what I said last week. It's such a beautiful thing that we are so different. God is a creative genius in this department. And then I ended my thoughts last week with a sneak preview of today, a little foreshadowing, if you will, when I said, I don't have to have all the gifts. I just have to use mine. And then I have to make sure that I have enough folks in my circle to make sure that I'm covered. It's the beauty of the church, really. Together, we have all the gifts. As long as some among us can heal, and as long as some among us, among us are wise, and as long as some of us are outspoken, and as long as some of us are prayerful, and as long as some of us are mindful and caring and compassionate, and as long as some of us have faith, then together we are all that God needs and wants. I don't have to be all the things. And then I said, repeat after me, and no one was here in the room, but repeat after me, I don't have to be all the things. I don't have to be all the things. Isn't that the best news ever? I said all of that knowing that today was coming. I knew we were going to be hit with now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, which means that you are an individual, but together we are a we, a collective of gifts, a collective of talents, a collective of passions. We are the body of Christ, which is perhaps a better way of saying we are the church. I don't have to be all the things. But we can be all the things and then some. We are all the things and then some. If you're sitting in the room, perhaps you are shocked by today's sermon title. So for those of you out there, the title of the sermon is Stop Going to Church. Please don't take me too literally. What I want is for you to stop thinking in terms of church being a place to go. Certainly if you're saying anything resembling, oh, I have to go to church today, or I've got to go to church. Especially if there's a whine or a dread or an eye roll in your inflection. I want you to alter your vocabulary, vocabulary to change your thinking about church. I believe if we would start saying it correctly, we might start living it better. So stop seeing this as a place you go to and start seeing church as who you are. We are the body of Christ all together. The church is us, not a building, not a committee, not an address. The body of Christ, known as Park Road Baptist Church, it meets regularly at 3900 Park Road. But Park Road Baptist Church is not a place. It's a people. The body of Christ, known as Park Road Baptist Church, keeps office hours. And in case you need to call us, 704-523-523. 5717. But Park Road Baptist Church is not a business. It's a people. The truth is, the church 
is really all of our phone numbers. And we are open 24-7. Maybe we should all text in the group your phone number so that we would all have the number of the church. The body of Christ, known as Parker Baptist Church, does not consist of one member, but of many. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. I am not a member of Park Road Baptist Church. I am Park Road Baptist Church. And so are you. We must stop going to church. And we must start being the church. I turn to the late great preacher Fred Craddock for a story that shows you what I'm talking about. Craddock says that he learned so many things when he was a young pastor in his early days of pastoral ministry. He tells this story that I just love. He says it was a custom in that little church where he started pastoring that at Easter they would have a baptismal service and being that they were a church that practiced baptism by immersion, but they didn't have a baptistry in their church. They always went down to Watts Bar Lake on Easter evening, right at sundown. Out on a sandbar, he said, I would stand with the candidates for baptism. One by one, we moved into the water, and then after I baptized someone, they would make their way across to the shore where the little congregation had gathered around a fire and they were cooking supper. They had constructed little, constructed little booths for changing clothes with blankets hanging, and as the candidates moved from the water and they went, they would go into one of these little booths and change their clothes, and then they would gather around the fire to warm up. Finally, last of all, I went over after I had baptized the last person and changed clothes and I went to the fire. And once we were all there together, all the new baptismal candidates were closest in to the fire to get warm while the rest of the church stood around them in a circle. Glenn always introduced the new people. For you see, he already always knew everybody. He must have been the Ann Miles of that congregation. <laughs> Glenn would give their names. He would tell where they lived, and he would tell what their work was. <clears throat> and then the rest of us who were forming a circle around them while they stayed warm by the fire just started popcorning this ritual where every person gave their name and said something about what they offer. My name is Jane, and if you ever need washing and ironing done, call me. My name is Fred. If you ever need anybody to chop wood, I can do that for you. My name is Susie, and if you ever need anybody to babysit, I love children. My name is Joe, and if you ever need anybody to repair your house, just call on me. My name is Lucy, and if you ever need anybody to sit with the sick, I am so good at keeping watch. My name is John, and if you need a car to go to town, I always have an extra for you to borrow. And around the circle they went, and then they ate supper, and then they had a square dance. And a, at a time that only Percy Miller knew, with his thumbs stuck in his bibbed overalls, he would stand up and say, okay, it's time to go. Because every church needs somebody to say when it's time to go. And as everybody left and Percy lingered around with his big shoe, he kicked the sand over the dying fire. After my first experience of that, Percy saw me just standing there, Fred says, still. And he looked at me and said, Fred, folks don't ever get any closer than this. Craddock says, in that little community, they have a name for what that's called. I've heard about it in other communities too, but in that community, their name for that is church. They call that church. So as we're gathered around this candlelight here in the fire, you might hear somebody say, my name is Russ, and if you need a bold car, I have got one for you. 
Actually, there are about four right now in the garage. You might hear somebody say, my name is Amy, and if you need a pound cake, call me. I don't even have to look at my recipe. I can whip it out in about 20 minutes. You might hear somebody say, my name is Dan, and if you need someone to commiserate with you about being a Steelers fan, I will text you through the games and hold your hand through it. I can also connect you with any number of possibilities for service in mission. You might hear somebody say, my name is Allison, and if you need a song, I will sing it for you. My name is Darren, and if you need to know about Cam Newton, I have some thoughts. Or if you need a good laugh, just follow me on Twitter. Or if you need someone to spend the night with our room and the end guests, I'm there. My name is Bob, and I can help you with all your concrete needs, and I will plant all the plantings at church. My name is Ann, and I can tell you the name of every single person sitting in this room right now. I can be the one to put names and faces together for you. My name is Rosemarie, and I can teach you how to make pillowcase dresses. My name is Heather, and I can help us with our money at church. My name is Jimmy, and I will help you do just about anything you need to do at just about any time you need it done, and I will end by saying I am so blessed. My name is Asha, and I give the best hugs. My name is Ella, and I will make fun of you and make you laugh. My name is Megan, and I can give you a massage, and I can do more than just heal the aches and pains in your body. But I will laugh with you in ways that will bring healing. My name is Cam and Jacob, and I will run the sound and the video, and I will help all of you out there be able to follow along. My name is Abby, my name is Lily, and I can make soap for you. My name is Beth, my name is Mark, I will teach Sunday school. My name is Dave, and I will lead the brass band. My name is Margaret, I can teach the children. My name is Lou, I can help you not be afraid to speak in public. My name is Cam, and I will help you with all the up-to-date things on COVID. My name is Will, and I can help remodel the sanctuary. My name is Chris, I will raise the money for Will to do that. My name is Kelly. I can connect you with a grief group for parents who grieve. My name is Ken. I will always bring Bojangles biscuits. Y'all, just stop going to church. Just be the church. You are the body of Christ. May it be so. Amen. As of today, we are halfway through the season for Ruminian, which goes from December through the end of March. Park Road has been a part of this ministry, which provides overnight food and lodging to homeless neighbors. We have been a part of this ministry since the program's very beginning, more than 20 years ago. Close to 100 different churches and faith communities provide shelter on a rotating basis every night of the week during the coldest months of the year. At Park Road, we welcome 12 guests in our youth building on the second and fourth Saturday nights. During the sermon series, we're talking about gifts and calling. Your calling can take many forms and lead to many different types of jobs and professions. But as followers of Christ, we are all called to serve one another and to care for the poor. Room in the Inn offers one way for us to do that. 
and provides a variety of ways that you can serve. I want to describe the entire process to you so that those of you who have not yet gotten involved can perhaps discover a way that you might help. It's always dangerous to single out people for thanks because others who have participated might feel left out. So let me begin by thanking all of you who have participated thus far this year. Many of you are the same people who make Room in the Inn function every year. So sincere thanks to all of you. Jimmy Neal deserves special thanks. He's really taken the lead in this ministry for many years, and this year has already signed up to pick up the guests at the Urban Ministry Center every Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. As you may know, Jimmy is a professional driver. He drives a small truck and delivers caskets all over Western North Carolina. In spite of the miles that he logs every day, I have to confess that I still hesitate to let him drive the golf cart when we play golf together. <laughs> if you've seen him drive, you understand. But he does manage to get our homeless guests to the church safely on Saturday evenings. So if driving is your thing, there are still a couple of Sunday mornings in February and March when we need someone to pick up the guests here at church at 7 a.m. and deliver them to the transit center. Jimmy has also already signed up to be the overnight host for two of the remaining four Saturday nights. So if sleeping is your thing, no, the truth is that overnight hosts do not end up sleeping very well. So if a good nap on Sunday afternoon is your thing, you might want to sign up as an overnight host. Another big thank you needs to go to Susan Melson. Susan has made all of the beds and put toiletry bags together for every Saturday night so far. And she has signed up to continue to do so through the end of March. I know because I have seen her spend hours organizing the linen closet and putting toiletry bags together. And she might be happy to have a helper making beds for some of the remaining nights. I have to warn you, we have had a little problem with geckos tiny lizards. <laughs> Susan does not like the lizards. So if you are someone who's not afraid of little, little lizards, I'm sure she would welcome you with open arms. The guests arrive at the youth building at 6 o'clock for dinner, otherwise known, I think, in the South as supper. Preparing a delicious meal for 12, and including hosts, maybe up to 15 people, is certainly not my gift. But I know there are some among you who are quite capable of this. Sometimes two families will coordinate together to provide a meal. We ask dinner hosts to stay and enjoy the meal with our guests. And I'm aware that this can be somewhat intimidating, especially if you hadn't had contact with homeless folks before. I've always found that anywhere there are a group of 12 people together, at least one of them is a Steeler fan. <laughs> and there's probably at least one who hates the Steelers. So that makes for some lively conversation. But on a more serious note, I've had a lot of good one-on-one -on -one conversations with our guests by just allowing them to tell their stories, where they're from, how they grew up, 
how they arrived where they are now. It's that kind of connection that really makes this ministry important. Another way you could help is to provide 12 grab-and-go breakfast bags or 12 lunch bags. This might be a good project for your connection group. And speaking of connection groups, one final shout out to George and Ann Miles' Abundant Grace class. They have rallied their group to completely cover one night of Room in the Inn every year for the past several years. That makes my job a lot easier and is really appreciated. Finally, after the night is over and the guests are on their way, there's a lot of laundry to be done. The young people carry the laundry baskets out and leave them in front of the entrance to the community center. So if you like washing and folding blankets and towels, pick up a basket and return it to the office before the next session. As you can see, there are a variety of ways that you can be involved in making this ministry happen. It's so important to be able to provide a warm and hospitable place for homeless folks to spend a peaceful night when it's 20 degrees outside. Often, it's the same people among you who volunteer over and over again. Let's all join together as the body of Christ and revitalize this crucial program with some new faces and new volunteers. Would you join me now as we pray together? Gracious God, we hope and believe that you hear our prayers. And in hearing them, you take them into your heart and shower light and love into those people who hurt and those people who rejoice and those people who plod along putting one foot in front of the other just for today. We hope and believe that prayer changes things and we pray for change in the world, that poverty would be changed into abundance, that swords would be changed into plowshares, that anger and fear would be changed into compassion and trust. We hope that prayer changes us too, that cancer cells would die, that prejudice would change into humility, that bones would mend and hearts that are broken would become stronger, that grief in the right time would turn into dancing. So we offer you our prayers this day, those spoken ones and those unspoken that have settled into our hearts if not yet into our voices. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we sing our final hymn, we would welcome any of you that are interested in joining the body of Christ known as Park Road Baptist Church. We would welcome you with open arms as we sing. Please be seated. As Dan mentioned, there's laundry to be picked up on your way to the uh, uh, parking lot in the back, and so if you are gifted with laundry doing, grab a basket and do it and bring it back to us before uh, our next gathering. Youth are going to lunch together. Joe and Liza are looking for teachers for Sunday school for children, for youth. You see all the things coming at us as ways to Live out your calling in this place. And we pray that as you leave this place today, you will find that out there just as much or if not more than in here. The final word is not ours, but the Lord's. So hear this good word of benediction as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and may God be gracious to you. May God give you grace this day to love with all your heart. That you might do justice to love with all your soul, that you might show mercy, to love with all your mind, that you might walk humbly with your God. As you go into the world this day, dear friends, love the Lord your God with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself.